the next presenter we have before breaking for morning tea is Kevin Friel, who will talk about the Barwon experience. Uh, Kevin's got over 36 experience working in the Australian uh, mental health system, firstly as a clinician and then moving into senior management roles. He's currently the Executive Director of Mental Health, Drugs and Alcohol Services at Barwon Health. After seven years as Director at the Cairns and Hinterland Mental Health Service, Kevin moved to Geelong uh, to take up position as Executive Director in early 2013, just in time for the NDIS launch. So Kevin has seen it all and we'll share some of those experiences now. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Arthur. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects to the elders past and present. Now, yesterday there were very many good speakers and presentations who spoke about a lot of the issues I had in my presentation, so I think we might have an early tea break uh, this morning. So I pruned things down a bit. So there are four areas I want to go through in the next 20 minutes. Um, as we talked about yesterday, a lot is in the translation, as I understand the language of both systems. No disadvantage, so again, the aim of the uh, Commonwealth State Agreement uh, were that there be no disadvantage to people by implementing the NDIS scheme. Avoiding those sinkholes, and I'll talk a bit more about what sinkholes or gaps there may be in the service. And then lastly, the tier two and where to with this population. So again, as mentioned quite often yesterday, it was about the language and understanding uh, what we use, so it's important to know what we're labeling and how we're labeling it, and is it we understand the same thing. A lot of discussion has already happened around permanent significant impairment and recovery princi principles, so I won't dwell on this, but other than to say that this is uh, in the Barwon experience in the very beginning, um, a year, a little over a year ago. Um, there was a huge difference in the understanding of the language uh, about permanent impairment recovery. At that time, uh, the NDIA um, really had, in my view and many others, no idea what recovery meant in the mental health context and weren't in the beginning. Um, I don't think we're all that interested in it because they had a system to implement, they had legislation they had to follow, rules to get going and let's just move on. And it wasn't that rarely that we were heard people from the NDIA workers say that, well, it's in the legislation, we can't be changed, and the participants are permanently disabled anyway, aren't they? So let's just get on with it. Fortunately, over the last uh, nine, 10 months, this attitude, I think, has significantly changed in the Barwon region. Uh, there's a much more understanding around recovery, what that means to individuals, what it means in the mental health system, um, and more willingness uh, within the NDIA and Barwon to be as flexible as possible within the parameters and legislation they have to work in. Um, and I think a, a lot of this has been due to a couple people in the uh, NDIA service and borrowing, Stephanie and Tori, who've done a lot in helping translate the language of NDIS and the service providers and public and private and borrowing and translating our language. So we're getting on the same page, not quite there yet, but getting there. <coughs> One of the big issues, um, I think, was an understanding of what an insurance scheme is in a health care system. It is still something I think many people don't quite get their head around that NDIS is an insurance scheme and what that actually means. Because we're all coming from a healthcare system background and we assume it's just gonna replace or be an adjunct to the healthcare system. Well, it's not. Um, in a insurance scheme, it's uh, lifelong, you're always in it. It's in the business of providing financial protection for property, life, health, etc., against specified contingencies. 
and involving payment of regular premiums. That's the usual kind of definition of an insurance scheme. So in the NDIS, the participants are seen to be uh, uh, being serviced for lifelong for with through individ individualized packages. Um, the participant um, chooses what services they need, the consumer choice, which is very important, and the NDIA planner decides and works with the consumer what can be funded and what can't be funded. That contract or that agreement, the plan, is then left to the service providers and the participant work out how, when, and where that can be delivered. And as mentioned yesterday, there are issues around funding and the viability of the plan's uh, activities. Again, that's quite contrast to uh, what we understand in our healthcare system, um, which is a um, group of people, organizations, uh, whose primary intent is to promote, restore, and maintain health and to include efforts to influence determinants of health as well as direct health improving activities. Now, often in the healthcare system, the consumer would come and would, um, in the healthcare system, and they would be more or less directed as which pathway that they'll fit into, be it in the acute health, whether you're gonna have a hip replacement or knee, you're gonna have this procedures done to you. More or less, that has happened in the mental health system in the past. Fortunately, that's changing uh, slowly, but it is. Um, so it is a quite a different way of perceiving the, the two systems. And this is still something I think consumers, carers, and providers need to still have that conceptual understanding about the two. Case management, care coordination. Um, Boundary issues um, may arise in, in the understanding of what mental health means by case management and when, what NDIA means by care coordination. The, in the beginning, the people I was talking to in the very early days of NDIA didn't have the understanding or concept that mental health actually do case management, care coordination is part of a normal role. <coughs> of uh, assisting people. Um, in Barwon, uh, there was a very low percentage in the beginning of NDIA participants who were assessed as needing care coordination funding in their plan. And that was something that was quite surprising not only to the NDIA staff, but also to the, the service providers. And that also just speaks to the fact of understanding what is needed in case management or care coordination. In the Barwon area, care coordination between the in mental health services and NGO providers is very well advanced and has been for many, many years where we actually are sharing the same clinical file. And I think that was mentioned yesterday. So the NGO provider uh, would work with the clinical, clinical team, look at the same clinical information, have the same joint planning, consumer care is involved in that. And so the coordination, that's case management, was more often not very seamless and everyone knew what was happening with each other and what the directions of the service outcomes were. Um, again, this was talked about a lot about yesterday about ineligibility and decline phasing. One thing I'll just say about this is that um, in the beginning we were hit when the I think it was in May, June, when all the transition of the people, consumers from the PDRS agency were going to go into NDIA. Reams and reams of forms were sent out, and the, the NGO workers worked off their feet to try to get that accomplished. Then very quickly in the public system, uh, we were starting to see some resistance in that NDIA had a six or eight page form for psychiatrists or medical staff to fill in. And not surprisingly, the psychiatrist in my system said, no, we're not gonna do this. We don't have time to fill in six, eight pages. Don't understand it, not gonna do it. But a very positive outcome was that through negotiations I had with the NDIA, we're able to cut that eight page, six page form down to a half a page, two paragraph form, which suited the psychiatrist, got the basic information that NDIA needed, 
to take off that bit on their checklist. Psychiatrists were then happy to do that, and things moved on pretty smoothly from there on. So again, the negotiation, the regular communication was vital in getting some movement. Um, the other point on this is that in October, and I'm sure these figures have changed now, but some information that I received that in October there were 150 consumers in the category of phase and decline, 73 were deemed ineligible, and 52 chose not to proceed with NDIA. So that's the third number in October that at that time. Those figures, I think, I believe the last, last I've heard was have been reducing, so people are being uh, chased up if they're in the phase in decline or uh, refusing to enter into NDIA, and those numbers are coming down. But it's still a fair percentage in, in October who were deemed ineligible or chose to be not part of NDIA. So again, just another little picture about uh, ensuring it's in the translation and the understanding what we're doing. Um, I'll move on. Yeah, so make sure the translations are correct. Okay, the next one is about uh, no disadvantage. Um, so we've heard before so there's been some unintended consequences. One of them is uh, the consequence of shifting higher costs onto the healthcare system for those who are not in the scheme. Um, now for people who, for whatever reason, who are not in the scheme, uh, will need to have continuity of support. There is agreement and commitment that continuity of support will continue during the uh, trial phase. But the question is, is that going to continue in 2016-17 uh, or not? It is vital that they have this continuity of support to maintain their well-being and the recovery progress. Um, if that's not there, then there's an obvious risk that uh, the person will become unwell and then may perhaps re-present to the acute service um, and have a unintended consequence of relapsing and then more cost onto the acute service. We know that um, if the acute admission it would be about four or five times the cost of good community care support structures in place. The, the public system can't afford that and that's something we obviously for everyone's sake need to avoid as much as possible. There are possible costs onto the public system uh, could be on the workloads of mental health service in the community. Um, if people in phase two or who are chose not to go into NDIA under the tier three um, need to continue to have supports, if those community-based infrastructures aren't there at, at an adequate level, those supports are really only going to come back onto the community mental health public system. That's some increased caseloads and I'll talk a bit more about some impacts of that. As you've heard in Victoria, NDIA has absorbed all the programs, 100% handover of all community mental health support stru structures. <clears throat> this is the current government agreement between Victoria and the Commonwealth. But I hear and hope there's um, some consideration may be given to rethinking or renegotiating that position. Uh, as we've heard to yesterday and today, all of the states and territories have had a, a mixture of what's still held and state funded and what's NDIA funded. One of the um, probably biggest impact of the unintended consequence has been the, <coughs> excuse me, the work that's been required of the non-government organizations in transitioning to NDIA. I think this has been uh, a much larger um, piece of work than anyone anticipated. And others yesterday and later on today will have talked about the financial, 
and the workforce challenges as a result of that transitioning into NDIA. The potential for fragmentation of care coordination. As I mentioned before, that this is a real concern that if people who are, have a plan and the service providers in that plan aren't aware of who's providing what, and there may be multiple providers, and if the community mental health adult um, public s service isn't aware of who's providing what, then that does open the door for a lot of potential fragmentation in the coordination. As it is now, um, the decision to share that information between service providers in the plan and the public system is up to the individual. And that's, that's fair enough, that's their right. But often we know that people won't readily or early divulge that information that I have this provider and that provider doing these things. So the public system may not know and even the other providers within the plan may not know who's doing what. <coughs> so what can be some suggestions on what can be done is um, data sharing. <coughs> and as I've heard Arthur say before, data is king. And that's been talked about a bit today. Agreements need to be formed between NDIA, <coughs> the state governments, local service providers, and of course the consumers, that data can be shared between providers in order to achieve uh, reduced fragmentation and better care coordination and better outcomes of care. The way to do that is when the participant signs up with NDIA, gets their plan, they are discussed with them in a conversation with the planners at NDIA of giving their informed consent that yes, it's all right, I have my plan, I have these three providers providing community support services, I'm also in case management in the public system, I'm happy for all those people to know my full plan and who's providing what. It's a one page form for NDIA. I think it will achieve, achieve a huge impact on better coordination and better, better care. Plan implementation um, has been problematic for NDIA, the consumer and the providers. Um, I think that's improving, but again, there seems there, I think there's room for um, some development in the consistency in applying the criteria as to what elements are in the plan, and that's something I think NDIA, at least in the borrowing area, is well aware of, and are working towards uh, looking at that. Consumers and carers need to understand the plan contents. I've heard reports from some carers and consumers that you know, they get their plan, but they're not really sure exactly what it all means in there. That the plan activities are financially viable for the service provider. And there's a timely response to plan revisions. Again, we know that needs of uh, the individuals can change very quickly. That needs to be a very responsive and quick turnaround in, in needing to alter the plan, not in a year or six months time. And again, there's uh, improvement uh, with family members being more involved in assisting with the eligibility assessment. Again, in the very beginning, I think people have heard this before, is that it was deemed to be the individual's sole responsibility to get themselves to the NDIA. Case managers were not <coughs> encouraged or allowed to come in. Carers may not be. That is changing and that's a very good outcome. So we're getting there, but these um, COGS are we've not quite aligned yet. and. Um, but I think the potential from forums like this and other meetings, uh, they will get aligned. Sinkhole. So y'all, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of sinkholes on TV, on TV and reports about them. 
these unexpected appearances of the sinkholes can have very damaging effects. And they're really due to weak supporting structures beneath them. That's what kind of forms and causes the sinkholes. I've used the term sinkholes, and just other than say they're gaps in the services. So to avoid sinkholes forming, we need a very strong community-based mental health services and specialist mental health services uh, will need to shift in the way they traditionally provide services. I don't think we can continue providing services as we have for the last 36 years and, st and hope that these same calls just won't appear. There are new players in the market. NDIS obviously is one major player. Agencies, we need to continue our collaborative dialogue between state, local, and commonwealth departments um, in order to ensure that we can identify and get some trend data that we can avoid or fill in if a sinkhole does appear very quickly. We've had some recent meetings in the borrowing area with commonwealth, state, local service providers, NDIA, and they've been very productive, and those meetings happen on a regular basis. Again, sharing the relevant information, be it qualitative, quantitative, or clinical information, um, is going to be key in uh, helping to identify potential structural weaknesses and what can do to avoid that. And obviously, uh, we need to stay positive. It's, um, people can see this as a challenge and a diversity, a negative experience, but there are so many positive things that the public system, the NGO system, the NDIS system has to give that we need to keep focused on the positives so we can have the best possible outcome and be innovative and adaptive where we need to be. And that is a challenge for a large public system at times. So just another few pictures of sinkholes we want to avoid. <laughs> okay, tier two. So very quickly, this is probably the, the biggest concern I have of what's going to happen with uh, in the defining with people in tier two. Um, now that figure of about 300,000, I think that's been downward estimated. I heard that some time back. Um, again, I know, we know that the work that Eddie and others are doing in the NDIA to try to define the parameters, the numbers, what the needs are of this group of people um, is going to be something that's a big piece of work, but it's going to be essential because uh, it is this cohort of people who have the, don't have a permanent defined serious mental illness, the episodic. Um, and it's these people who will be coming in the years to come, at least in Victoria, if we keep the same system where all services of NGOs go over to the NDIA, there won't be that infrastructure of community supports to, to meet the needs of people who are in Tier 2. Um, those people, because if we don't have that community mental health support structures still in place, where they're going to go, like I said before, they're going to, worst scenario, they become unwell, back into the acute mental health system, worst possible outcome for everyone. Um, I think now is the time, uh, they're talking also, I guess a question I have, and maybe later is, talking about tier two is the information linkages and capacity building package. That uh, sounds very good, very nice, phrase, but what does that actually mean? And what, who's going, who would deliver it, what it consist of, and will that be something that will actually impact uh, positively on this group, large group of Tier 2 people? Um, the era of consumer-driven marketplace, I think, is coming, or it's not already here. That means there's going to be increasing competition. Public mental health systems, NGOs, must start to rethink now what services they can provide, to whom, at what cost, and with what outcomes. 
question will not our workforce and the public system or the NGO system will be ready. What we need to get our workforce ready for this change. We obviously need to be talking more with our consumers and carers about what their expectations are in order to position our workforce and our services to better provide evidence-based practice. The funding models on mental health services from the ABF uh, is very similar impact than what uh, I think we're seeing with the NDIS funding models in the NGO world. This will fundamentally change a lot of the service that we provide in the community and in acute inpatients. Again, this will be data in September, tier th out of the tier three approved mental health participants, 22% were deemed ineligible uh, for a range of reasons in bar one. Again, that number has changed, that was back in September. Um, I've talked a bit about that, I know the time's running out. Um, I guess the, the last closing questions I have is that well, wonder what the interface will be between the new primary health networks, their role with the NDIA, with community mental health support services, with the public health system. Those three, four areas, what will that look like in 2016? And something I think we need to really consider what the interfaces will be. And also, um, <laughs> what about the people with coexisting mental health and drug and alcohol problems? And it's a challenging area, but as far as I know, people with drug and alcohol problems are not part of the NDIS scheme at this point. As we all know, 70, 75, 80 percent of people presenting to mental health services have comorbidity, drug and alcohol, and mental health. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time, but we do have time for one or two questions. I see a hand up there. Um, I'm not sure probably here. We haven't got loud enough. Um, the Tier 3, three approved... We can't hear you. I'm not sure what that meant. So, um, Tier 3 approved, but then ineligible. Yeah. Approved... Out of the Tier 3 group, a uh, cohort of people who are... You are identified within your service. Sorry? Sorry. I'm not sure the approved... The tier three are the people who are currently in Barland, the people who are currently receiving uh, non-government support services. Ah, oh, okay. And who met the criteria of uh, significant permanent disability. Okay, yep, thanks. So out of that group, at that time, 22% were ineligible for a range of reasons. Okay, okay. other questions at all? There's a question over to the right. Yep. I loved your pictures about sinkholes. I'll just preface what I'm going to say with the fact that I wasn't here yesterday, so these issues might have been discussed. Um, one of the things, I'm a consumer advocate, and I guess I've got a special interest around life expectancy and um, physical health comorbidities. So one of the sinkholes I see in the discussion so far is that no one's mentioned uh, physical health mm. um, and, and you know the possibilities for that. Um, I think the other thing that I've always been concerned about with this process is that some of the really good things about, say, the FAMS program is that it's sort of focused on kind of daily life challenge and a bit more functional. And I feel that, and again, this might have been talked about yesterday, but one of the things I've been really concerned about is people who have um, trauma histories. And we kind of know, you know, there's the science around how many people in especially drug and alcohol problems, you know, have a high prevalence of trauma. So the more we move back to the diagnostic system, the more people whose sort of primary life course is sort of, you know, influenced by trauma, the more risks they are going to sort of fall into other categories or you don't have schizophrenia or you don't have bipolar or whatever it might be. So I guess I just kind of want to name reorienting our system towards recognising that what we actually die from is physical health um, mm. issues and um, the risks around people with trauma histories kind of falling into a sinkhole. Yeah, I guess to just comment on that is that it, it is something that I feel is uh, critical that the services 
um, start focusing more of its attention. I think David Buck alluded to this yesterday, on more on primary mental health care, working with the uh, focusing on physical health, dental health of our people who are in the in the service, or it could be in early intervention, prevention, and promotion work. A lot more effort needs to be done that, and needs to be done in partnership with GPs, the primary health networks, the local Medicare locals as they are today, um, in order to address that and try to deal with that area before they come into the more of acute system. And that's an area that is so important for the community support services who have a key role in helping to provide those primary health services. For me, uh, was not a question, it was just a uh, comment um, that uh, in Victoria, uh, this is already happening across Victoria through the state reform of the state funded community mental health system using the NDIS criteria. So um, that means once the, the uh, NDIS is rolled out, uh, depending when that happens, probably 99% of the clients in the state funded community mental health system should be uh, immediately um, eligible for NDIS. Um, so that kind of matches the 100% of funding going across. Mm. Um, it still leaves the tier two question, mm. but it's happening now, not then. Thank you very much, Kevin. We'll leave it at that for now in terms of questions. Kevin, we'll be around during morning tea.